passionate instigator and dynamic problem solver, Dr. Kevin Ross Emery, the host of the Dr. Kevin Radio Show, will be taking you outside the box, behind the curtain, and identifying the load of BS we are fed every day. And now, Dr. Kevin. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome to the Dr. Kevin Show here on Ohm Times, where we're changing the world. Wait for it. One ohm at a time. Please, as always, remember that this is a live call-in show. So if you wish to share a thought, ask a question, Offer an opinion, as long as it's respectful, you may do so by calling in at 202-570-7057. Again, that's 202-570-7057. Tonight's guest, or, you know, I don't call her a guest. She's my revolving co-host that comes and plays with me when her schedule will allow it. He's uh, none other than the Reverend Dr. Lori Powers Otto. You get full title tonight, baby. Yay. Uh, yay. I figure at this point, you know, everybody needs to kind of sort of tune in on on what you're bringing to the table, especially for tonight's discussion. But before we go there, for those of you who tuned in tonight, because this topic interests you, and then those that just tune in every week because, you know, it's always going to be interesting, as they like to say here on the Dr. Kevin Show. So, Dr. Dr. Otto, um, how have you been? What's been going on? What's new in your world? Share a little bit, you know, as a Revolving in and out co-host, you know, our listeners, inquiring minds want to know. Well, see, I I have just been straight out busy. As uh, many of our listeners probably know, I am part of New Hampshire Metaphysical. And with that, I do at least one event every month whether it be our wonderful psychic circles, which I absolutely love, love, love doing, or our weekend psychic fairs that that are online for an entire weekend and then then the one day in person. I will always be at that one day in person. Um, Love doing those. Oh my gosh, the connections, the people. Um, And you know, just various different things like that. But going along with tonight's topic is very funny because I just started writing a new book. Wow. <laughs> That's, tell me more. Tell me more. It's called God's Not What You Think. God's not what God thinks either. So, you know, it's all fair and love and war. Uh <laughs> I just started writing that recently and uh, uh, take what little spare time I have. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping to have it out by the end of the year. Good. Good. Well, that's exciting. I look forward to, to dedicating a show once the book is out and our listeners can get it to kind of talk about the book and, uh, you know, kind of let them know where to get it. So we'll be keeping an eye out. And this will be your third book, correct? Correct. It will be my third on my own book. I'm very excited. But what about you, Dr. Kevin? What have you been up to? You've been up there. Well, you know, so... uh, I first of all have I'm I'm launching something new in September, so I'm talking about that on whenever it's appropriate on the show. Uh, I'm going to have a communications course. It's called MIA Communications. MIA stands for Mastering Intentional Authentic Communications. Love it. 
And as a communication mastery class, the way that it's going to be set up, this is a whole new format for me, but I'm, I'm making lots of shifts and changes in my life for a number of reasons. And this is going to be the first of multiple mastery classes that I'm going to be turning out in this format. So what's going to happen for the student is the student will sign up and will have a start date that has yet to be determined, but it will be sometime in September as in the school year. And then they'll get a 45-minute uh, Zoom class that I've pre-taped on Tuesday. Uh, right now, is that's the working concept. And then another one on Thursday. And then on the following Monday, they will have a live Zoom class with me that is just going to kind of review content, answer questions, help them apply the information, and then they'll get the next class on Tuesday and on Thursday and the following Monday, the same thing will happen. So it's kind of a hybrid. They get access to me um, or and, and plus they're going to get the material where they can do it before we get together. So instead of doing like an older format of like a 90 minute class where you go over the information and then you make time available to discuss it. They get to watch it. They get to watch it as many times as they want, come up with their questions, take it in. And so the first 12 classes is the first module. And that first module is what I'm calling me versus the module. And in that, the two, um, it's about, having more mastering intentional, authentic communications within yourself. How can you have it outside of yourself if you don't have it inside of yourself? And, you know, I'm sorry, what did you say, Lori? Oh, I said that makes sense. Yep. So, Everybody has a cacophony of voices sitting around in their subconscious, their traumas, their fears, their indoctrinations, um, the uh, experiences they've had that have sometimes led them to false ideas or false belief systems. Um, but we have all of these different voices, and if we aren't aware that we have them and we don't learn how to identify them, then we are inconsistent because if this voice is answering this question and that voice is answering that question, they may not be in integrity with who you would like to think you are. You know, one of my big pushes these days, besides calling out indoctrination everywhere I see it, is the very simple is truth equals action. That you, you will always hear the tr you'll always know what the truth is by the way the person acts. What actions are they taking? And so, a lot of times in over thirty years of working with clients, where I make the greatest breakthroughs is when I get them to realize that what they say they think they believe isn't follow through in their actions. Their actions say there's something I sometimes I use, sometimes I still do call it, you know, like the the man behind the curtain, the voice behind the curtain, the voice that's in hiding, that's feeding things into you through your subconscious, which then means you say who you want to be, but that's not who you're acting like. So after the module one, people can move on and take the same module, same setup, but then it's you and me. How do I take this newfound discovery and make all my relations better with other people? So that's kind of the thing. And then the third part of it will be retreats, what I'll do for small groups that have a similar theme, like for couples, or it could be for a board of directors or a board of trustees. It could be for a family unit, but it's, it's going to be, this is the theme, and it will be a small intensive group where we dig in and really apply. So I've got that on the horizon. 
Um, and I'm very excited. Go ahead. Oh, I just said excellent. And I'm going to be doing several of these mastery classes. I really, you know, 24 books in, a dozen DVDs in, 30 plus years in, I just really want to turn this into, I want to take and create stuff that at some point, and I, I even have a couple of people that I'm going to be working with that can be catalysts, like I'm a catalyst, to people taking the class. So if they say, hey, you know, I'd really like to apply this, but I'm struggling, I'm having some stuff, then they can choose to do some one-on-one -on -one sessions to really make the breakthroughs. And so I want to do that, and I see this as something that there will not be enough of me to go around to do it with every person that takes the class. So I'm going to bring in people that will be trained in my languaging and the way I do it. Um, you know, one of the things that I'll be discussing is the wheel of chaos and other different concepts. And, you know, I'm, I'm choosing people who I know are already grounded in the foundational same ideas or the same values or they see the world I do but they're going to have to do it with my language to work with the people because they've taken the class. So it's not like I'm taking somebody who says, hey, I've always wanted to be a coach. I've always thought that I had psychic abilities and wanted to help people. Uh, no, this is people who already have established practices, established history, and all they're going to do is learn the language of my system to be able to work with people in the terms that they're being taught and worked with with me. Because um, I don't know about you, but sometimes you, you see these classes and courses and weekends and the big kahuna on the front stage pawns you off to somebody in training that has about five minutes of life experience and took a weekend class and doesn't know one end of reality from the other, but they're suddenly going to be coaching you. You know what I'm talking about? I 100% know what you're talking about. The, uh, the wannabes that haven't really learned yet. You know, I, we, we see them all the time. You know, uh, certificate collectors or people who will take it that they think they're an expert, but they're not speaking the same language as the person who's presenting the program. So you're really getting mixed messages. And that sounds like what you're absolutely trying to avoid is you want your message to be clear, concise, and, and uh, to the point. And, and, and consistent. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's consistent. And, you know, part of the problem is information without application is useless. And so many of these programs that are going to teach you how to be a coach, and some of them go three, six, nine months or whatever, um, one of the problems with them is the people either don't have enough life experience or they haven't been able to take what they've learned for information and actually apply it in a real – and so – the people that go to work with them are their guinea pigs of figuring out what this actually means in the world. And somehow I think doing, you know, five hours or 10 hours with a single person that your instructor saw you over with um, doesn't really give you a broad base of foundational life experience. I mean, am I just being arrogant? No, no, because uh, sadly, you and I have both met people that, yeah, they don't have any life experience. I mean, heck, there's even some people that don't even take the course and then say, I'm an expert on whatever. And I'm like, what training, what experience, what anything do you have to back up? Well, I just know. No, that's not good. <laughs> Both love that that you want trained, knowledgeable, <laughs> put the message. <laughs> wow. 
well. <laughs> and give them tools so that they can incorporate it, they can live the what they're learning. You know, I always look back that when I when I started my spiritual practice 33 years ago, that you know, I had started working as a professional psychic when I was 16, 17 years old. I spent the time to really work on and understand how my psychic worked and what it meant. I mean, I was in high school going to weekly metaphysical groups to try to understand this gift that, you know, I've told the story a thousand times. I'm not going to tell it again, but, you know, that, you know, my grandmother t told me I had when I was four. But having a gift and knowing what the hell to do with it are two different things. And, yeah. you know, I taking that time and becoming, you know, to understand things like tarot and astrology and, and channeling and, and the different things, well, my gifts were kind of pouring out so I could give it language. But then, you know, almost 15 years in the corporate world doing training and working with people and personnel develop, people development and training programs and all sorts of different industries, when I stepped out to create the union, I had a number of skill sets and experiences that collided together. And were my early clients, were some of them a little guinea piggish? Probably, but not. But I never hesitated to know I was bringing value to them, that they were walking out there with value if they chose to take it. Right. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, I mean, so that's exciting. And then I think you and I are going to be playing on August 6th, uh, 4 p.m. I read a quick email, and I and so, but you had talked about New Hampshire Metaphysical, and one of the things is that we're going to be doing a new program. I don't know if it's going to be every four weeks, six weeks, maybe every couple months. I'm not sure, but it's it's giving it to the world, and this is really for spiritual seekers especially for people who maybe just recently felt like their religion wasn't giving them their own pathway to spirit or God, feel lost, feel disconnected, that have questions, that know that they're looking for answers and these are not answers that they've been able to find. And there's a lot, especially in the day of the internet, you and I know what, Lori, there's a lot of what on the internet? <laughs> Not allowed to say that word on air. We'll just say crap. <laughs> a of, there's a lot of crap. There's a lot of people that are a whole lot more showmen than shaman. There's a lot of mixed messages. And so the first one, August 6th, it's going to be free. We're just going to reach out to people who may be curious. I think um, I'm going to be on it. I know you said you were interested. I don't know if that's a firm confirmation that you can do the six because we'll do another one. Um, but hopefully you can. And we have somebody else because I want to keep it to two or three of us. But the topic is about am I psychic and what are psychic abilities? And again, this is just going to be a free Zoom. I hope, I mean, my Zoom program allows me to bring in 100 people. I hope that we have 100 people that take advantage of being able to hear how three of us talk about it. I think I know who the third person is, but I haven't confirmed it, what we have to say. And then we're going to be answering questions, and we're just going to give it away. You know, we just want to give – I just want to give people enough foundation that they're going to be able to identify – if and when they decide to choose a spiritual teacher or a set of classes, that they have enough foundational knowledge. And I know, I, and so thoughts on that. What do you, how do you feel about that? Because I know you said you'd be willing to do it, but we haven't talked about it. So we're on air. Why not talk about it on air and invite all of our listeners to hear our conversation? 
<laughs> no, I love this. Love this because there is an overwhelming amount of stuff on the internet. It gets confusing. It, it gets overwhelming. You know, and, and people need guidance and direction, but they need support too. So, like, you know, when I first started all of this, I actually went to school to get a PhD in metaphysics. I went to school, you know, right, but you have to know what's the right school or right teacher. I mean, I took classes, I took courses, I got, you know, whatever. And I, I love that we are going to offer this for free, get them the ability to find their own path. We're not going to give them a path. We're going to help them find their path. But paths with integrity, paths that affect their their needs. And I, I just think it's a wonderful, wonderful gift to uh, be able to share with people. Yeah, and again, I'm not sure how often we're going to be running these, but I, I want to be offering them on a regular basis. And I want them to be different every time. Right. I came up with the title, Am I Psychic? And a discussion about psychic abilities. I don't know what the next one's going to be. It may come from the audience. It may come from another practitioner. I don't know who's going to be on the panel, but when as a team at New Amsterdam Metaphysical, we made the decision, uh, no surprise, this was my brainchild, right? Uh, that we made the decision. That we made the decision we were going to go forward with it, you know, I I said, because there was, you know, well, you know, you're talking about two to three to practitioners, but, you know, we may not be able to find that. What happens if we don't find one? What happens if the date doesn't work for anybody? What happens if I said, I'll do the damn thing alone. It's not like I can't, but I want to give them... I want to give them your perspective and another person, not just my perspective. I, I want them to, to do that. So anyway, so I'm excited about it. Yeah, definitely. So let's get into tonight's topic. And I'm going to ask you this question, and we may not get it completely answered before we have to go to break. But... Tell me what you know about the Reformation. The Reformation? Uh, <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know. Do you know what I'm referring to? I don't. I, I've been lost. But my mind has been shot all day, so I apologize. No, no, it's okay. The Reformation. Um, and I... I think it's been called, I think it's called a couple of different things, but it's when the Protestants broke away from the Catholic Church. Ah. It's when the Catholic Church imploded. And you had all of those religions spiral off. Now, do you know what I'm talking about? I, do. I don't know what I'm thinking, but that wasn't it. I'm totally lost. You know, those things happen, and they've happened in every religion that we know of where people have branched off because their beliefs or their ideologies or their needs have changed, right? And whatever they started with doesn't fill their needs anymore. It doesn't feel right to them anymore. And I don't have a problem with that, but it's the problem that I have is there's no, then all of a sudden you're right and you're wrong and I have a huge problem with that. <laughs> so, the interesting thing about the Reformation, and I feel like we are back in a way almost in the energy of the Reformation in some ways. But the thing I always found fascinating about that period of history was, you know, for over a thousand years, you had, you know, you had your Asian religions, you had your Muslims, 
and you had your Catholics. And then you had little indigenous tribes that most of the time were getting swallowed up, converted by the sword, forced to give up their their belief systems, Wiccan, pagan. But you you know, and and then always waving through there we've got the, the, the Jewish faith, which for people who don't maybe aren't aware of it, Judaism is the father of both Islam and Christianity. Yeah. Um, and so in that, part of what made that unique is that the Catholic Church had brutally kept power and incited violence and killing. They were so corrupt at the time. They sold indulgences. They, um, there was no real God kindness left in, in the church structure. The kindness came on the priest and the monks and the, and the nuns who, who had a personal calling and were out there doing the work. But the organization itself had got rotten to the core and was, was you know, and were burning people at stakes and killing them and doing all sorts of horrendous things. And you had, in a very short time, all of these other religions pop up. The Protestants, which is the protest, the protest religions. Protestants, protest. We are protesting the Catholic Church. And that they pushed back against the corruption. It, everybody lost faith in, and trust in the Catholic Church, or not everybody, but all of those people that broke into all of the modern-day um, Protestant religions completely lost faith in the Catholic Church and its ability to be the holder of the will of the Christian God. So does that make sense when I say that? Yeah, no, and that is correct. So, opinion that is the historical fact. Yeah. So, and one of the modern day religions that that came out of it. Ed, you're gonna have to come back after break <laughs> to find out which which religion am I highlighting in this next sentence. Conscious Media for Conscious Minds. Ohm Times. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Join me every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio for Vox Novus, the new voice. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. If I could be you. And you could be me. For just one hour. If you could find a way. To get inside. Each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a mile, mile in, in my, my shoes. shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes.
Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Dr. Kevin Show. As we're getting into the thick of it, uh, remember, this is a live call-in show. You're welcome to call in at 202-570-7057. That's 202-570-7057. You're welcome to call in, uh, ask any questions, offer any opinions or insights. Uh, we just ask that they be respectful. I'm here today with the Reverend Dr. Lori Powers Otto. And we are just digging into the topic of the day after a little chat in the first part of the show uh, about what's going on uh, in our world uh, and some upcoming exciting events. A uh, July 22nd in-person psychic fair in Nashua. That same weekend, we will be doing an online fair where readers will be available uh, at uh, fair rates to uh, hop on a phone or a Zoom with you, and then in-person readings. And on Saturday night, we'll be doing Voices from the Void, where three of us are going to give you a buckle your seatbelt spiritual night of God knows what, and God's not telling us yet. But show it up if you're a spiritually adventurous person. I know there's probably there's going to be some meditation. There's going to be some potential drumming. There's going to be some spirit art. There's going to be some psychic messages. There may be some channeling. But it's kind of the people who show up will determine how spirit wants us to best serve them. Now, there's a concept. You just open up and say, hey, spirit. What do I need to hear or learn? And Spirit says, show up at Positive Street Arts in Nashua, New Hampshire at 630 on 722, and you'll get your answer there. Uh, pay attention so you don't miss it. Uh, <laughs> um, all that said, the one religion that came out and didn't come out as a religion, but really was part of the Protestant Reformation and the separation and the breakdown of the Catholic Church as being the all-powerful um, owner rights on the Jesus, on the Jesus mobile, um, is that science, modern science came out of that time. And modern science came out because they lost faith in the Catholic God, but they wanted to prove that God existed through intellectual exploration. Like, they wanted to study and understand the, the miracles that God created in the, in the form of the human body, in the form of the, the environment, the nature, animals, that some great power created all of this fascinating and highly, even now, mind-blowing complexities of how things work and interrelate, that science is still discovering new things every day. 600, 500, 600 years later, we still are just every day proving that there is some kind of supreme intelligence, whatever you wanted to call it. It wasn't more until like the late 1800s that science started to dip into the, oh, we're going we're gonna to prove God doesn't exist. But, you know, science went the same way of the Catholic Church at that point. It went into a place of arrogance where it became about the egomaniacs of the church, the egomaniacs of science who forgot what their real missive was was to know the mind of God by studying all that God created and expanding ourselves. I know you realize that, but any thoughts on that before I move on? No, that, that's, that is also part of, uh, part of my book, because that is exactly what happened. And, and it, it's, the science is starting to change again back to proving that God exists, that God is, that God is. But through science, we're, we might be changing our definition of what is. As, you know, so I, but I, you're right. I mean, 
science came out of that, out of the Reformation, started out with the best intentions, got lost on its way, money, power, ego all took over, and now they're starting to come back. So, you know, just manage. <laughs> So one of the things here is that we have come, I call it to, you know, the, the, we're in another rounder version of the death of the dinosaurs. Uh-huh. And really, the Reformation, it didn't kill the Catholic Church but it made it evolve if it was going to stay at all relevant. It may not have evolved a lot, but it did change that church. And the Protestants came out, and of course I come, I spent last week at the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly. Um, As we evolve, Universalists never believed in a hell. They didn't believe in a God that would create a hell. The Unitarians did not believe in the Trinity, that, you know, that there was a single a connective unit that ran through all of man, all of humanity, that we were all one at the core. No matter who we worshipped, we were still all one at the core. Right. And so here what's happening is we're going through a death of the dinosaurs, And part of what I want to talk about in in the write-up, I don't know how much you laughed when you saw it, but the number of churches that are buying a one-way ticket to hell in a handbasket is astonishingly, astonishingly large. But I think we're starting to see their numbers getting smaller, which are your fundamentalists. As Papa called them, your religious nutcases, your whack jobs. Um... (laughs) Share some thoughts on that. Well, you you mean the ones that are the only ones that are right, according to them. (laughs) Their way or the highway and everybody else should die? Those those the ones you're talking about? I'm talking about the hypocrites, (laughs) and we go back to the place where I started. Truth, you see truth in action. And I challenge anybody that calls themselves a Christian that is preaching a doctrine of hate, a hypocrite. That is, you know, that is, you know, you've heard me through the years call them Bible bullies. The minute that, you know, Jesus got off the cross, they broke the cross into bat-sized pieces and started beating people with it. But these are the egomaniacs that are in charge. These are the cult leaders. And, of course, we, just, we, just, we had just recently a president who only became president because he was a cult leader locking into deep primal fears of a group of people who are afraid that they're the dinosaurs that are dying. Right, right. Thoughts? Well, you know what? Those people aren't wrong in that respect. They are the dinosaurs that are going to die because they just, they refuse to evolve. They refuse to, they refuse to love. They don't even love themselves. And I'm sorry, first of all, you cannot call yourself a Christian if you don't live in the virtue of love. You just can't. And all those people that that do and espouse hate and limitations and you know let's you know let's make people give birth to babies but let's you know not feed them clothe them educate them and who cares if someone kills them with the, you know an automatic weapon those are not Christians those are all hypocrites those are liars those are I can't say what I want to say <laughs> well you know and. This is one of my other favorite, or it seems to be one of my favorite things these days, which I'm talking a lot about either in classes or when I speak or even with privately with clients, is identifying, recognizing, and calling out the level of indoctrination that these cult members, which are your fundamental Christians, you're the only way Christians, 
you're the eradicate the transgendered Christians. Um, the ones that are preaching hate. Right. The ones, yeah, who have completely picked and chosen. I saw this interesting thing. There was a meme that I saw, and I just loved it, and, and I grabbed it, and at some point I'll probably share it. But it's this, like, you know, a, you know, somewhat attractive young guy in, in the meme, and, you know, and he is pointing out the fact that it was... Um, I was born a sinner, too. My sin is mentioned in the Bible 25 times. I tried to change but couldn't. Luckily, society learned to accept us left-handed people. Right. Nicholas Ferroni. Yeah. Hey, yeah, 25. <laughs> well, go ahead. What? As someone who is left-handed, I'm very mm -hmm. familiar with it. And it was amazing, even... As a child, the sideways looks the you're less than. You shouldn't exist. You're, you know, someone said I was a spawn of the devil. That's why I was less than. No, I'm a yeah. child. You know, I'm a child of love. I'm a child of God. I, you know, but, you know, that narrow-mindedness has no place. In, in this world. It just has no place in this world. But I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so I wasn't raised Christian. I have Christian family members. I even have some of the more fundamentalist Christian family members. And that's their journey, but I recognize them as indoctrinated because indoctrination means you're taught to not think for yourself. You're taught to not ask questions. You're taught to just accept what's being said and follow like sheep. Right. <laughs> and the level of indoctrinations in some of these, and I have worked with recovering Catholics, recovering Muslims, recovering fundamentalists, recovering Mormons. And, I mean, this indoctrination goes back to the womb. Yes. Yeah. And, and your baby... Go ahead. I just said, and it's terrifying. And, and it's terrifying because they're afraid to question. They're afraid to think. They're afraid to have agency. They have been convinced that they do not have the mental capacity. They're treated like children that have to be, you know, herded their whole life, or they will, they will fall to sin. And as I've shared before, and I got this actually from somebody else uh, who used to be my business partner and my significant other for seven years, uh, sin, self-imposed negativity, S-I-N. That's all sin is, self-imposed negativity. Yeah. But anybody who is obsessed with sin is feeling, is, is, is living a guilty as shit life. Yep. And, and can I, I say, I don't understand that as, as a reverend, as someone who grew up a Christian, as someone who studied all of this, I don't understand how someone can believe that God would give them free will and punish them for you. How, you know, if you don't, you know, put the spoon on the correct side of the plate, and you're going to hell. If, you know, if you jaywalk, you're going to hell. I mean, it's silly. And the sad part is, for many of those people that are living in that indoctrinated reality, they're already living in hell. Yes, yeah, they're uncreated. The, 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 yeah, because let's face it. You can't, you can't, 
You know, especially the ones that get really like, even if you think it, it's a sin. No, thinking is not a sin. Right. 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 It's pretty, I mean, but, yeah. But one of the things that the Catholic Church did at that time before the Reformation and even somewhat after the Reformation, but as it was going on, besides trying to burn as many of the leaders of the Reformation as possible or their followers, burn them at stakes or punish them or whatever, was they went after scientists because scientists were inviting people to think. And in and and the church didn't want thinking members. They did not want mm-hmm. questioning members. And we see that today. When I hear terms like woke, it's like, yep, it is a good thing. We want you awoke. We want you awakened. We want you present. We want you participatory. We want you questioning. We want you evolving. And they have and, and evolving is the um, a, a Tiffany, uh, I'm not pronouncing the word right, but it's the polar opposite of what these nutcases, indoctrinated, cultish, pseudo-Christian religions are preaching. Exactly. And that's why, that's why it's back so hard, though. They're afraid. They're afraid that if enough people start thinking, they will become like the dinosaurs. It, and and hopefully they will. I mean, I do feel that more and more people are waking every day. More and more people are starting to question and and change the you know their mindset. We're becoming more welcoming and more loving because that was all bred out of us over the years. You know? We it wasn't that long ago when you know, an Italian couldn't marry a Spanish person or you know a black person couldn't marry a white person. That wasn't that long ago. It was within my lifetime. Right. Yeah. And what did they hate? <laughs> you know. I mean, it's it's it gives me hope. It gives me hope that we are growing, but they're they're grasping at their last breath. They're they're fighting to keep their foot in the door, and I say we shove them all out the door and shut it, and, and just have love and understanding and cooperation, and you know support each other and be there for each other. So. You know, one of the things here, Lori, is that um, one of the ideas I came up with, and we know that crazy doesn't even begin to describe when it comes out of my head, right? (laughs) But I want to invite, you know, so first of all, Unitarian Universalism, the religion I belong to, was a Christian-based religion until 1960. And 61, when they came together, they had already been the people, the, the 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 birth of the humanist movement and um, all of that stuff. And there was struggle. There was there had already been a lot of struggles, um, but they decided that they were a religion that welcomed Christians but was not limited to Christians that it was open to everybody, that that's what it should be. And, of course, your modern UU church has some denominations that are are much more Christian. There are some that aren't really Christian at all. There are some that are very, uh, you know, they welcome, you know, pagans and Wiccans, and uh, you will find uh, Jewish and Druid, and you will find Buddhist, and you will find them all happily coming together based around the principles of Unitarian Universalism, which I'm not going to go over all of them, but I'm just going to say the first one is the inherent worth and dignity of all people. That they ask that you, to be Unitarian Universalist and to be in covenant with us, that you recognize the inherent worth and dignity of all people. That all people, not just some, not just the ones you like. 
all in triple underlined all. Yeah. And so, but so it's sometimes it's hard for me as somebody who was not raised Christian, not that I haven't been had, had my occasions where I have had Christians try to spiritually abuse me. Um, I feel sad for, for lots of people who I've helped. And I know you have helped people like this too, who have had God taken away from them as a word because it's so traumatic. Have, have, uh, you know, are traumatized by, by Jesus because Jesus loves you means I'm going to beat the crap out of you and be critical of you and tell you how undeserving you are. I mean, another day, another story, and we're going to run out of time, but some, someday I'll, I'll tell the story about going to church with my mother, and she never invited me again afterwards. Uh, uh, but, but I have an invitation, and it's an invitation to people who see themselves as actively Christian, that feel like they're living the Christian message, that they believe that, that in, in living it, Christian in action, I think the group should be called Christian in Action, the CIA, the religious CIA. And I would like them to see them take Christianity back. I would like them to start unifying and going against what is a minority of Christianity. It's still a minority. The nutcases, even with these big mega churches, if you look at all the numbers, they're still the minority. And that they need to push back as a cohesive unit of people that are actually living Christ-like lives and, and, and say, we do not recognize you as a Christian religion. You do not act in Christian ways. And, but I, you know, this is one of those where I really think it's got to be the Christians that throw out these deviants, these cultists, these egomaniac, these hate mongers. And yeah. so I'm inviting my listeners to take my idea. If you are a Christian, I support and applaud you being a Christian. If you are a Christian in action and you feel like the message of Christ is sacred to you, then how can you sit back and let other people abuse it? You need to call them out. You need to start to recognize, you need to start to push back. You know, the whole thing with the Southern Baptists that got rid of three congregations because they had women pastors, because women are not suited to be ministers, even though one had been a minister for over 30 years of a very yeah. successful congregation. This is the desperate act of a dinosaur. Yes. Bad. Bad. Some of the earliest... So, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Some of the... Good, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, some of the earliest preachers or pastors were women. The ones who were in the, the communities and the in the villages, most a lot of them were women to start with. So this whole thing about women not being able to be pastors and reverends and whatever is just a desperate thing for power. Yes, and it gets more and more ludicrous. And all we can hope for is more and more people who are actually living a Christ-like nature, who are Christians in action, that they will rise up, push back, speak out. They should be the ones that go step in front of the nutcases when they're attacking the transgendered and attacking the drag queens and attacking the, the immigrants. Oh my God, there is nothing any more anti-Jesus than deciding to attack the immigrants. Right? 
right? Like, this is such a blaring hypocrisy that you have to be a blind man not to see it. But as Papa always said, there are none so blind as those who choose not to see. So that's what I want to start. I, not I, it's not my battle. These are not my nutcases. I have my own nutcases to deal with. <laughs> that take the lane I travel in and turn it around and try to form cults and do judgment. Lori, thanks for coming. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. Next week, Matt Connerton will return. And we'll talk about what's going on in the political world here on The Dr. Kevin Show.